Can I call upon uh, Professor Vivekanandan then to say a few thoughts? You're starting your, you're starting your round table now. The round table begins now, okay. so a few thoughts on either of these provisions, either the, the you know, the, the intermediary provisions or uh, technology protection. Okay. So I, I, I thought I will uh, start uh, a little, little bit uh, in the sense morning I've been listening to a lot of this discussion about the title itself is Towards a Fair Balance, a uh, question mark. So balance is one aspect and whether fair balance is another meaning to the whole discussion. And uh, obviously the question of uh, uh, the balance, whenever we talk about balance, uh, we are not going to talk about some scientific balance. At least we are talking about uh, three major players. I don't know in which chronology, uh, consumers, and then uh, creators, and then uh, distributors or disseminators. Are they equal triumvirate or some level of hierarchy in that coming? Probably without uh, creators, there are no disseminators. But uh, without uh, consumers, there is no disseminators, as well as creators could be another argument. How do you look at it? But uh, probably fundamentally we are now in one level of <coughs> position. We are even introducing uh, um, market issues, etc., economics, which are all relevant. But if you fundamentally look at the jurisprudence, if at all to tell that uh, the whole current illusion of copyright law and its legitimacy is based on certain utilitarian percepts. So we are talking about uh, maximum for the maximum number seem to be one, one of the guiding factor in trying to achieve the balance. So in such case, certainly the maximum good for the maximum number may not be looked in the same perspective from this triumvirate, you know, of consumers on one side, another side, uh, the creators, or another side, the disseminators. Probably uh, that kind of, uh, I would say, dissatisfaction uh, came from both sides, that it should have been much better, or somebody said that we have to wait and watch, at least. At least from consumer point of view, we are not also looking at it. And in that sense, uh, I will specifically stick to uh, techno uh, impact copyright and impact on technology. And a little bit of introduction was given by Pranesh in the beginning about the technological protection measures. So the one question was begging is, probably there is no big apparent, at least I understand, apparent demand to bring in DRM from any big quarters. Uh, means uh, at least uh, my browsing of the various consultative process, that uh, it was not there. So the first question begging is, uh, why this? Uh, DRM provisions ever came, is it that we want to show that we are very advanced now itself and probably in any future bilateral trade to tell that we are already in that because always when compared to patent regime, copyright always boasted that, you know, it is trips plus, you know, uh, 50 plus 10 we had and then probably without being part of treaties, etc., why did we bring in DRM? That is one question. And second, uh, is it some kind of mechanical way of thinking that uh, there's a very advanced thing in other jurisprudence, so we are bringing it here. Or in such case, even then, uh, means uh, the policy makers and other consultative committees which looked into that, did they ever look about the problems which arose out of the experience of DRM in the other jurisprudence? If they have kept that in mind, probably uh, means, you know, I thought uh, uh, Section 65A, which we are really talking, probably need not come at all in one sense without any big demand at this point. Uh, 65A, it talks about, uh, you know, any person who circumvents effective technological measure applied for the purpose of protecting and the intention of infringing such rights. List what is given, if you apparently look from 2A to G, by and large looks from a concern of national security, whether it's decryption, whether it is, you know, running something, etc. It's never looked from a perspective of any uh, consumer, you know, what you call as whether any fair use provisions which I can use, even it moves to digital as a professor, I use fair use things. And then it says that fair use provisions will apply. But the question simply comes, if somebody is going to take action, then I'm going to go to the court. Similar parallel example I'll give, we are more or less kind of converging between copyright and IT Act. When 66A of IT Act came, the biggest concern raised at that time was this, this provision is going to lead to a lot of issues. And they said that if it comes, we will legally see in the court and it will be legitimately used. It was seen in the last five to six months, 
66 years created such kind of issue. Leave alone educating the police. Leave alone educating many things. So here is a question. Technology is going to be with you know, powerful you know, industries or people who have stakes. And then what about consumers in the whole thing? Probably they have to resolve the matter in a court. Probably they have to go to the court and resolve the matter. What is fair use, what is not fair use is going to be a later stage. So in my opinion, 65A bringing in, the, if you look at this discussion of impact on technology, I thought, uh, I thought, I mean, I could not find that why it jumped and came in when there is no big demand, when you are not part of a treaty, and then look at issues. Just I'll flag two, three things about some of the issues which happened post-DRM in the United States. Uh, one, one, just to give some illustration. One was in 2009, uh, suddenly Kindle gets a notice from the e-book owners, that is Animal Farm in 1984, and suddenly Kindle, since it's, it has its DRM measures in place, all the people who had this in Kindle suddenly found it's vanished. They came in, they cleaned it up, and they even gave the money and went back. Whatever you bought it, we are repla replacing it, but they could simply get into your, you know, uh, book and then remove that and go. And uh, this, this simply is something, uh, the battle between some owners and the battle between some disseminators, and disseminators also have their economics of law, so they don't want to really challenge or do anything, rather they will comply and return the money and get out. So it, it's, it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a different age and a different way you are, you are, things are controlled. Another one, I, another example which uh, was often quoted is uh, Lexmark. When this company had its uh, DRM in place, you use any other cartridge in the you know, printer other than Lexmark, it will not take it up. And then if people used other things to remove that, they file cases on that. So it's like, uh, even though they don't own such an IP, they try to establish through the DRM part. Similar example came on TV and TiVo, where somebody produced a program where you can remove advertisements when you're really, you know, what you call us, um, you're copying. And these people, Turner, uh, uh, Turner Corporation, filed a case based on DRM circumvention. Of course, um, Pranesh said what well, Solace is that he, 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 of course, he did give a certificate. This seems to be the best among the DRMs. But my whole question is, when there is a big issue about DRMs itself in certain jurisprudence, which is slightly advanced, which uh, there are enough lawyers to, you know, put some collective action, etc. Here is a case where I think we have jumped too much the gun on DRM. That's my opinion. Uh, whether it is better than others, whether it's more humane than others, is again a thing question because uh, whether it's human or not we don't even have a legal capacity in this country or people do not have that kind of thing to you know take on this but so this I thought probably we are trying to tell the world that we are more advanced uh, without being asking for this one comment give and leave it. I'd actually agree with uh, professor on that point that we have probably tried to be quite advanced and proactive when bringing in these amendments. Because historically, if you look at it, India has always played catch up with its amendments in any legislation, especially with something involving copyright. The technological advancement that has happened is obviously much advanced than uh, what we probably could have thought 10 years back. So it is not that we are obligated to bring in certain changes bring in certain amendments, but probably we try to create space for more technological advancements to come in. But obviously, if you go through the amendment, there are areas which has not been clearly defined. There are places like uh, if you see that um, when you are talking about uh, TPMs and who are the, you know, who are the person who is facilitating circumvention. It's a very dicey, very vague way of putting it. We don't know whether it's facilitator. There has to be a mainstream in it. It's a criminal thing. And probably you can also bring in, whether you can bring a charge of, you know, uh, aiding and abating circumvention to him. That is not something which has been clarified here. 
what is the penalty that he will have to pay if he doesn't maintain the records? How long will he have to maintain the records? These things have not been clarified. So probably we need some judicial intervention in future or probably some more amendments to see all these things. But overall I would say they have tried to maintain a, a fair bit of balance. We tried to do a bit of a tightrope walking to bring in certain changes which were definitely required. Yeah, sir. Uh, this is on the question of uh, was there any demand for looking at DRM. When the committee was set up, the core group was set up in 1999 after the amendment. In fact, the core group was first set up in 1997. And there were two things, if I recall. One is to ask the question what are the amendments to be carried out to make Copyright Act in compliance with TRIPS? That's one. Second, is there any amendment needed in the light of WCT and WPPT? Because India was actively negotiating on WCT and WPPT, though they have not taken any decision on whether to join or not. And third, what are the practical problems confronted by the implementation or working of the Copyright Act? Because there are a lot of concerns that have been passed on to the, passed on to the you know, ministry at that time. Now, uh, the committee during 97-98 uh, uh, could address only one issue, that's the TRIPS compliance issue. And though there were some discussions, they said it's possible, but then one major issue that has been addressed at the time was the computer software and the issues connected to computer software. Uh, the reverse engineering provision that has to be built in on section M because there was no balance on that. That means the two issues regarding t compliance of WCT, WPPT and the practical questions were not addressed by the committee. Uh, by when the 1999 amendment has gone to the parliament. And the committee was again reset up on, uh, after the amendment was carried out. That's on 2000. And the two mandates continued. That's to look at the Copyright Act to find out what are the things to be done on WCT, WPPT. Because performance right, the amendment and performance right was purely based upon the WPPT. Because one may ask the question, what is the reason for that amendment? But when we met the core group, the core group was a very big uh, you know, representation from industry, lawyers and other things. There are, there are definite pressures to follow DMCA. Definite pressures. I don't know whether it is Indian industry or Indian industry represented by foreign industry. And then it took almost one year the committee spent on uh, 67A. And there was, the committee was asked to look into the amendments carried out in DMPA, the amendments carried out in uh, European uh, uh, directives, the amendment carried out in Australia, and the amendment carried out in uh, Japan. These were the four uh, models available at that point of time. And we were, uh, at least the committee was aware for a long time of the intended consequence that was emerging out of it. So the drafting that took place which substantially remained as it is, was fully conscious of the negative consequences that uh, take, took place in other jurisdictions. And it got strengthened when we move forward, because you know, maybe around 2002, around 2002 this um, you know, got shaped up. We never wanted to get involved into the type of uh, DMCA provisions. At the same time, we are looking at it what type of uh, you know, loose type of a provision will uh, take care of the requirements. And when it came to 19, 2009, uh, there was again a pressure to follow a DMCA. And the negative effects of DMCA, which has been brought to the notice of the government, prevented the government from really looking into what has been drafted. So there, it is not that there was no demand, but then I'm not sure whether the demand is from the domestic industry or domestic industry represented by foreign industries who were uh, who, uh, you know, talking or behaving through uh, the domestic industry. There was no foreign representatives in the committee. It was only Indian representatives. That's the clarification I want to give. Thank you. So essentially, uh, 
if, if I get the message right, uh, it was a piece of very skillful drafting, which appeared to do something, but effectively made sure we did nothing. Uh, so that uh, uh, we limited the scope of uh, the technology protection measure uh, to make it sync with actual instances of infringement. And one might ask, if you're so sure that the infringement was going to happen and you were only really catching instances of actual infringement and the use of technology measures, so, you know, breaking the technology locks that would be so connected with the act of infringement, well, then you could really just catch the act of infringement itself. What use would this be? So, you know, is it going to be redundant? Is it going to have some value? Uh, but at the end of the day, it's a, it's a piece of skillful drafting that lets us communicate to the world that, you know, we're, we're technology savvy in one way, where, you know, we intend to go there, but, you know, we have our concerns and we'll, we'll, we'll remain within this, uh, within this sort of narrow gap. But, Shaman, just one 30-second point to that. Uh, Professor Vivekanandan mentioned the Lexmark case, right? Now, clearly, uh, if Lexmark tried to do the same thing in India, they would have no right. Okay, the TPM could be broken. But the question is, if Lexmark use, is using one particular form of, of DRM that no one has, has managed to crack yet, then despite them not having a right, uh, I, I can't think of any provision under the Consumer Protection Act against, like, under which I could proceed against Lexmark. Th there is no protection, even though I have a right to break the lock, there is, in reality, I can't, and, and so I, I'm, I'm stuck as a consumer. Uh, to valid point. My, my personal view was very clear because I was, of course, the, one of the negotiators of the WCTWPPT because I was in the team, and I wrote an extensive article on where we stand. I was saying that there was no need of an amendment because there is a definition for uh, plate and there is a provision for pe person who are in possession of the plate and the definition of plate got amended in 1992 which included a device. So I took a stand by saying that that provision is good enough. That was my personal stand. Uh, but then when there was a push for uh, a specific provisions, then we were worried about how will you strike a balance? Because the last part of WPPT provision makes it very clear that you can exempt it what has been permitted by the law. So the class two of uh, uh, no, 61A, that notwithstanding anything contained, anything, any person can do the following acts. And class subclass little a is precisely meant to cover 52, the entire 52, because anything permitted by the law. I see the point of Pranesh, on uh, where duplicate keys are not available. That's very, very valid point because that was not probably thought of at that point of time. Um, people were totally ignorant in many ways and we could not predict what type of technology will develop. So we want to be very, there was a pressure to have a definition for measures. There was a pressure to have what to define effective. All kept completely uh, open because uh, it's, it's too, uh, too ambitious to do it because we thought it's the best way is to leave it to the courts to evolve over a period of time. Professor, yeah. Professor, that, that's what I said, Professor. This is cases in 2009. Uh, these cases are happening. Probably, uh, are they a little fancied over the DMC happening in U.S. as a very, uh, in parallel with advancement of technology? Or did they know that sometimes when we do, uh, differing with him, we do late, we realize others' problems. They are getting an advance 10 years before that we want to emulate what is another jurisdiction. No, it's not. It's so very, this it's, is happening in the last four or five years. You know, it's, Probably it's, this it's, it's not what we want to want to show that we are very advanced. But then there was a demand internally. Mm -hmm. And we know the problems, what is happening abroad. And then how will you structure a provision so that's what, which that's is what, less harmless? That's what I was telling the morning discussion, more or less weed around uh, creators and disseminators. From the consumer's point of view, you know, there's no structured lobby or to even to talk about some things. So one is the issue... No, no, no. There was, a, there was an extensive comment given by, uh, yeah, I know, uh, I know um, uh, lawyers, uh, lawyers collect, not lawyers collect, Lawrence Liang, uh, Lawrence Liang, when that, this was put on the website. And there was, I still remember there were some comments came from Internet and Society on uh, 69, 65A, but their arguments was there was no need for us to introduce. Uh, 
Yeah, there was no what you call positive type of a suggestion by saying that the following provisions could further dilute it or further take care of it. The type of issues which Pranesh now raises has not been addressed at that time. Otherwise, we would have got an opportunity to have a relook into it. Uh, we were also worried when the committees met subsequently that if you reopen it, it may go into the wrong direction. It was also a concern because we don't know how the pressure groups will take it. So there was also a serious concern with that. I still remember Madhukar uh, uh, you know, looking at it when he was a registrar. It's a place where it has gone into a website and we got all the comments and then the committee sat through backly. I think uh, Madhukar will now supplement. <laughs> yeah, you see, um, I don't know, um, uh, this issue of uh, was this amendment required, it, there was no demand for it. Um, you have to look at it in uh, this form that there were so many other things that were not being demanded. No director came to us, gave us co-authorship. Okay. Nobody was saying such things. But then it's a question of the word fair. Do, are we going to attempt something that is fair? Okay. So in a series of things, um, was this required? Was this required? Was this required? Where is the demand? Is, exhaustion of rights. Where did it come from? Did anyone demand for it? Nobody did. I don't recollect any input from any, uh, uh, any source coming say, please give us the ability to uh, take in parallel imports. Nobody said that. But it, it kind of stuck out like a th sore thumb. What is this? Why do we have this provision at all? Okay. It's a different matter that it didn't, didn't go through due to various uh, oppositions that uh, it almost did. Let me tell you, by 2006, the kind of uh, draft that was ready, it almost did. It, it is only that after that there were so many iterations that somewhere, somewhere along the line, some of your very smart colleagues read that and said, my God, what are these guys attempting? And so the issue came up again. As regards this uh, thing about trying to be very avant-garde and, and DMCA is the flag bearer of modernity and therefore we should uh, look at that. Um, let me share with you that the government, despite whatever it might appear to be doing everything at the behest of people from across the Atlantic, it has a very, very healthy, and at times bordering on unhealthy, disrespect for those guys. And the moment you start pushing, and they do push very hard, the Americans are very hard in pushing, uh, everyone kind of stonewalls. And, and by the way, stonewalling is a term, very American term, but everyone does in India. They don't yield very easily. And bureaucrats who stonewall their own citizens, stonewall the Americans even better. So, uh, this provision, specifically this provision, does not pass the muster of the Americans. They have objected to it. They say that it is non-compliant with WCT, WPPT. Okay, the TPM provisions. We said, okay, fine. We are not going to join the WCT, WPPT. In fact, it is, for me, it was a kind of a surprise that in the SOR we mentioned that we intend to perhaps uh, now, that is like, uh, as we say in uh, Hindi, that Kulhari uh, par marna. I mean, there was no need for us to have mentioned, but perhaps that is what it is. So that's the small bit of the politics. I just one, one, one back, what, when you said that whether, whether everything was demanded, certain things came. I, in my opinion, we are discussing about a fair balance. So if you are bringing in something in a fair balance without asking, that's really welcome. You know, it's, we, you, you probably use ideological term called progressive. You know, but otherwise, what I, I was just looking, as you said that, since these two treaties were not part of that, probably, or probably some part, we are trying halfway to tell the Americans we are doing something. I'm not telling about individuals or anything, but I'm generally telling. And of course, as Professor NSG said, there may be technology companies which may be enamored by this or which would like to take advantage of this. But I said that since the question revolves around fair balance, that probably looking from consumers basically right at a point even creators and disseminators join together creators and disseminators will be quite happy in a DMCA situation in US because it gives them something but I was just looking at a large chunk of you know consumers what we are really looking 
who are quite helpless and hapless in many ways. As I said, there may be a lot of things they cannot do, as Prana says. But if somebody files a case on me, do you get my point? They have the muscle and I, as an individual customer or a student, you know, I am not going to really go to the court. I would rather like not to experiment anything of thinking what is fair, what is not fair. It is in that context I said that uh, probably it looks, uh, you know, certain things, as you said, it is fully appreciated from morning that India took its own style of looking at things with all pressures, demands, managing it. Some look like maybe, I said, maybe it's a doubt it looked like that we are postmodern, you know, being this. That's a, that's a kind of... Thanks. There was uh, an old professor of mine, that, uh, Professor Gopal Krishna also knew, he happened to be the ex-Vice-Chancellor uh, of NLS as well for a certain time frame before he went on to found uh, NLU Jodhpur, who had this famous saying uh, that law and technology is a bit like uh, an Indian wife. You know, law is always seven steps behind technology. Um, and in that context, I, I want to really pose a very specific query to our panelists. Uh, you know, the one thing that's troubling me a bit, in, uh, and, and maybe specifically to Mr. Kumar and, and, and to the others as well, given that he presented uh, on the intermediary liability provisions. Now, 52.1b and c, I'm just worried about the overlap. Because uh, 52.1b seems to suggest that the moment it's a transcendental or incidental storage purely in the process of electronic transmission, then it's fully exempt, right? 52C then comes in and says, same thing, transcendental or incidental storage, for the purpose of providing electronic links, access or integration. Now, access is pretty much what an ISP does. Uh, if, I interpret, if I read access widely, I, I, in many ways, I reach the same result as 52B. And so, am I taking away from 52B <laughs> Uh, you know, what I've given in 52B as a full-fledged defense, am I taking it away in 52C because of the potentially wide way in which access could be interpreted? If not, in what way would we interpret access? In what way would we limit the scope of 52C so we don't have this uh, statutory interpretation confusion? And number two is, um, uh, you know, to me, it, it just seems a little odd that, you know, here's a conduit. Presumably the statute has called it a conduit in fancier language. ISPs are not particularly discerning, right? <laughs> Intermediaries are not very discerning when it comes to legal notice. In fact, none of us are. The whole point of uh, clarifying the law as specifically as we can is because the moment somebody sends a legal notice, there's a huge shadow effect. You, chances are you'll move in more for compliance than non-compliance, even though technically the legal notice is bad in law. They don't have a, a valid claim. And that's exactly borne out by your empirical investigation, which is that the moment I get a legal notice, I will by and large not investigate whether you actually own copyright, whether there is some right over this, whether I should take it on, I will take it down. That's not hitting just you and your business model, that is hitting the consumer. And I think Vivek raised that question very validly, uh, that the consumer is directly impacted. Uh, and, 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 and so, you know, we have this very funny dealing of technological concepts through the law, and I think Professor Ennessy also uh, raised a very pertinent question in the context of the MySpace case, that, you know, can you just, you know, read in technology so flippantly into these structures that, you know, don't adapt to them very quickly. Uh, if not, what is the solution? And, and more specifically on this, uh, what would your response be to 52B and C and, you know, just the dynamics of how they're going to operate out in the future? So maybe we can start with uh, Rajendra and then move up uh, the panel chain. Yeah, I, I agree uh, with you, Shamnath. Uh, 52 c is not uh, happily worded. Uh, uh, it will ultimately be left to the courts to interpret um, uh, and there are tools of interpretation, the legislative history, the fact that uh, Section 79 of the IT Act uh, does provide for uh, immunity uh, and uh, also the international debate. Uh, so I think the court will uh, obviously harmonize uh, these uh, ambiguities of the section. Uh, and, and my own uh, take is that uh, 52 c does cover uh, all kinds of intermediaries and 52.1b is concerned with the telecommunications uh, backbone service providers or internet access providers because all of these uh, intermediaries essentially uh, engage in transient or incidental storage so it's not a permanent storage but uh, yes 52.1c does leave uh, a good room for uh, for uh, you know arbitrary interpretation Um, 
given that B and C uh, can be harmoniously interpreted with B being restricted to ISBs, CDNs, VPNs, etc., and C being uh, larger than that, I think there isn't much of a problem. One thing I'd like to highlight about 521C, though, is that that is fine unless it has been expressly prohibited by the right holder. Now, on the internet, how would that happen? So we have an example in the US, uh, I don't know how well known it is, something called Dozier Internet Law Firm, okay, uh, D-O-Z-I-E-R. Now they specialize in creating uh, terms of service for different websites that can't practically be followed. Kind of like the uh, NIC here in India. Now officially, uh, if you want to link to an NIC website, you need to take permission from NIC before creating such a hyperlink. This negates the very purpose, the very point of HTTP, okay, the hypertext transfer protocol, which is based on links. Okay, so it's uh, and, and similarly, do, uh, Dozier Internet Law Firms, uh, the, the terms of service it creates, tells you that you can't link to any of the pages. So even while laughing at them and pointing to how stupid their terms of service are, you are actually violating their TOS. Now, if someone puts in that kind of a TOS, uh, which uh, search engines, for instance, through their spiders, okay, can't read, then what, ha what happens? So it, it might well be, uh, if, if we have judges as bad as those who are deciding the MySpace case and aren't able to appreciate the technology, then we might well have a situation where they say that this ridiculous term of service still is valid as per the law. So that is another ground for concern. And that's something I'm a little bit more concerned about, and as well as the restrictiveness of transient or incidental, uh, which is language that comes uh, from the European uh, uh, e-commerce directive, where it is transient and incidental, and that is specifically uh, for cash copies. Okay, so we've taken that language, uh, thanks to one recommendation of the of the standing committee, made it or, but still it, it doesn't it, it doesn't really protect online services as it should, quite unfortunately. I don't know much. Yeah, comment. just uh, uh, very no quickly. Comments, no comments. Uh, to to, to uh, uh, Pranesh, your, your your point that you know we're going to see a harmonious uh, interpretation. Uh, you know, it's, I'm an optimist. It's, yeah, exactly. I mean, uh, I was just going to say that given that uh, you know the number of times we see harmonious constructions in this space, uh, and 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 this is particularly problematic because here, I mean. It, you're going to say that, okay, 52B has a certain space, 52C has a certain space. Now, the question is who gets to define that space? If I define 52C and access in pretty broad terms, I limit the scope under 52B. So it just depends on what case is going to go up first. It's pretty much we're at the mercy of the flipping of a coin. Which case goes first? If somebody's going to expand out 52C, you have all the attendant problems with 52C, including the problem you just mentioned, which is that I can pretty much put you on notice right away. Right? So I don't even need to you know, do that 21-day business. I, in advance, I tell you that I don't need any of these, uh, you know, I don't need any of these links, I don't need any of these things showing up because all these are in some way proprietary because uh, they, they embed certain things that are proprietary because I own the copyright in them. Uh, so, so you know, once you expand the scope of 52C, you will automatically, if you want to be harmonious, you will constrict 52B, and I see that as a problem. So till the case is actually... Let's hope it doesn't go to the Delhi High Court. Oh, chances are it will first get there <laughs> before it goes anywhere else. And, and Chennai is getting as bad as the Delhi High Court now. So we're, uh, yes. I think the interesting link I see is uh, purely in a technical process in B. Uh, and electronic transmission or communication to the public. Now, it's very interesting because I was recollecting, uh, you know, why. The intention was very clear at that time when we were looking at it. We want to exempt certain people from full liability. At the same time, if the storage remains for a long period of time, 
rather than purely mechanical, then there needs to be some amount of check and balance. So, in C, how are you going to interpret the word transient or incidental storage? Now, if the storage is very momentary, but it is not mechanical, then the whole question of it remaining there is not going to be. If you talk about putting it back, or if you talk about giving a notice, that means the incidental and uh, no, tra uh, transient and incidental storage is for a longer period of time rather than a pure mechanical process and purely cash memory. Otherwise, there is no question of uh, uh, no, giving a notice to him and then putting it back after the failure of the notice or the court direction comes. So it's very interesting. I do agree uh, with uh, Rajinder and Pranesh that there is little lack of clarity with reference to the terminologies used. Uh, probably because um, uh, there was not much again of an input on this provision after this has been put on the web on 2006. Because this was one of the provisions which has been put on 2006 itself on the web. And uh, if I recall, there was not much of a uh, you know, input that has gone to the committee for relooking it into it and changing wording or whatever it may be. If at all there is something happened, is only after the standing committee and representation before the standing committee. Uh, but still, uh, you know, if the course needs to really harmoniously read B and C, the court read to ask the question, how long transient or incidental is going to be in B and how long transient and incidental is going to be on C. If it is a pure mechanical process, then C is go off. I, I don't know what type of activities which people do uh, because it's very confusing when we are looking at the literature to find out can we classify A, B, C that comes under B and X, Y, Z that comes under C. Because the type of activities of intermediaries were very, very confusing and there is not much of a clarity. But then the duration of the storage is going to determine whether you are going to come and the purpose of the storage is going to determine whether you are going to be in BRC. So more than who goes to the court first, uh, the which type of people are going to the court first is going to determine uh, where it is. And of course, which court is also a big problem for me. Thank you. We take a last question from the audience since it's almost close to five and then we'll close the session. So anyone with a burning question? Yeah, or a burning question. Uh, yeah, I'm Arohan Mansal. Um, actually, my question relates more to privacy. Uh, both B and C use this term transient or incidental storage. And as I was rightly pointed out, the term, the, the length of time of the storage would be uh, very relevant. So, uh, there have been a lot of incidents worldwide where the intermediaries have been using this as immunity and keeping users' data for as long as a period of six months. So this would be, I guess, the interpretation to this term would be very uh, relevant in privacy law, where that's concerned. And uh, you know, that's a thing that's to be seen right now. Maybe it could be one day, it could be one week or six months, as long as that. If the panelists want to reflect on his privacy concern that these sections throw up. Sorry, uh, just w one point uh, on a related note. Uh, the uh, the definition of RMI of rights management information uh, is uh, is very good, and it addresses privacy concerns. Uh, but apart from that, could, I didn't quite get your question. Sorry. Uh, it was uh, about under fifty two one C, and the interpretation. Uh, actually, the interpretation that would uh, of the term transient or in incidental storage, like uh, if it's for B, that would be very brief. It could be seconds or it could be a day. But uh, there have been incidents, uh, a lot of reported incidents where uh, I think it was Google. They were storing information for users up to six months. The entire web search history, like whatever you search in Google, is stored, logged, and it may be. 
like sold to third parties uh, for advertisement purposes and such. them having uh, exemption from copyright claims on that basis is a problem why uh, well as in because they should be liable for privacy violations that they commit but them holding your data which you provided to them hmm. should not give rise to a copyright claim against them right so I'm, I'm, I'm not quite very clear what your question is. I'm sorry. Uh, broad -based a bit. Are, there, I'll, I'll broad a bit. are there any privacy concerns that are slinking in through the amendments right now as we see it that, that are of concern that we need to address? In a way, also relate back, that back to the question of, you know, are there any missed opportunities when the law is sort of dealing with technology? that we've not taken care of or that we've not really See, section, uh, section 16 of the Copyright Act says that um, uh, whatever um, uh, rights um, in copyright law have to be claimed in India are governed by the Indian Copyright Act, but it does not uh, restrain a, 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 an action for breach of confidentiality. So, so if one were to look for a remedy for breach of privacy rules, uh, the Copyright Act is not the statute. One would look to some other form of, uh, of action. A couple of places. So while RMI, it's, it's uh, thankfully well-defined, uh, there's a mix between uh, 521ZB and, uh, and 65A on TPMs uh, where privacy concerns could arise. And uh, right now, uh, uh, it's, it's not just happening at a national level, but at an international level as well. At WIPO, uh, currently the uh, treaty or whatever other kind of uh, document it may turn out to be on for the visually impaired is being negotiated. And uh, part of that is an idea that you need to keep a register uh, or you need to have some kind of tracking mechanism. Now, TPMs allow you to do that kind of tracking as well. Uh, so uh, the question then arises as to whether a sighted person can go to a library, take out a book without necessarily having to give their details, or a sighted person can go to a store and buy a book without producing an identity card and that being tracked forever, uh, whereas a blind person can't. So uh, that issue does arise, okay, and, and how we negotiate, it, uh, negotiate that uh, is, is important. And, one, uh, uh, and, and, and this is an area where there's a little bit of, uh, you know, it's a, it's a bit of a gray zone because uh, if it is for the purpose of advancing certain rights guaranteed to you under copyright, but if it violates other kinds of, or if it uh, is not in consonance with other kinds of principles such as privacy, then what does 65A have to say about that? Okay, and if you can't claim it under a specific exception, then what exactly does 65A have to say about that? So, so it is a very pertinent uh, issue, but uh, I don't see it as much of an issue under 52, 1, B, and C, but more in terms of TPM, the exception for persons with uh, disabilities in 52, 1, Z, B, etc. So with that, uh, uh, may I please uh, thank all the panelists and the speaker for their wonderful presentations and their insights. Uh, and then as a token of our appreciation, may I call upon you to present the gifts. Small, oh, you'll make the announcement. We just have two small announcements to make. First of all, we would like to invite all our speakers, participants, as well as NUJS volunteers for dinner and drinks tonight. We've organized a creative a party in a creative village setting, and we hope that you're going to enjoy it, and we look forward to seeing you there. All those speakers who are staying at IndieSmart are requested uh, 
with everyone to proceed for coffee after which we have organized cars to take them back and then they can freshen up and the cars will bring them to the venue others who are not staying in this march should hang on in college and we have we have provided for some transport which will leave 5:30 onwards um and apart from that we request all nujs volunteers to go to either vasudha sharma or nitika gupta to get their passes finally we thank all of you for coming here today and participating in this conference we look forward to seeing you all tomorrow again and um, we can now proceed for coffee right outside